Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So back on the show today, Julie Martin, the first guest we've had back. Julie uh, is a very experienced yogi. She's bringing kind of movement, somatic approach to yoga. A founder of Brahmani Yoga. She works online with various yoga companies, starting her own yoga stuff online as well. Does retreats all over the world. Joining us from Hawaii today. Welcome. Hi, Mark. Thank you for having me again. It's nice to have you back. And I, I've said it online before, but I'm going to say it again. I'm terribly sorry for interrupting you so much the last time. Oh, no apologies needed. I enjoyed myself. That's really the bottom line. I had a good time on our conversation. You know, I think we, we both had fun. And I think I got excited. I'd had too much coffee that day. I listened to it back. And I thought, oh, my God. Now, a lot of people listen to this. I know I'm not a professional uh, journalist or interviewer. I'm just someone that likes to talk, talk about embodiment and chat to interesting people in that field. But I, I, some of them I, I sort of unforgivably bad. But that was unforgivably bad, that one. And I thought, you know what, rather than just apologize, we'll get you back on because we're having some good chats despite that. And I thought we can continue the conversation today. Great. Let's do it. So, so what are you working on right now? What are, what are you working on? What's, what's kind of uh, hot, alive for you right now? Oh, what's alive for me right now is um, just expanding the awareness of awareness. <laughs> that sounds so hippie-ish. <laughs> but, uh, that's exactly what it is. And I get really excited about wherever I go in the world. And of course, it's, it's all over Europe, uh, all over Middle East. Um, uh, I've been doing some work now here in Hawaii with, um, you know, some more teachers and, and everybody wants this. I can't say everybody wants this, but what I recognize is that everywhere I go, teachers pretty much say the same thing. Um, after just one session with me, they all say, this is kind of what I've been playing with at home, but now I feel I have permission to, to teach this way because obviously you're an experienced teacher teaching this way. And so um, I, think it's, I think it's becoming more uh, common for people to be exploring the somatic embodied you know, uh, movement in the, uh, in the yoga practices. And, and they're looking for ways to teach it. So that's really what I, because it's a different kettle of fish. Um, it's not teaching a cue-based system. It's not teaching shapes. It's teaching sensation. It's teaching how we feel. It's waking people up to being aware of themselves. And that takes a different language. It takes a different structure. And um, that's becoming really obvious that there's a huge need. There's a huge need for that across the board. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I'm, you know, let's define this kind of way of doing yoga. So different people listening to this, different backgrounds. So there's, there's ways of doing yoga that are about exercise, that are about physicality or ways that are about sort of somehow transcending the body. But a somatic approach, which is your, your main thing is, as I understand it, is feeling based. So it's sensory mm -hmm. and it's also taking the body as to be part of the human. So body of body is part of who we are, not as object. So that, that's Absolutely. my understanding of what that means. Is that aligned with kind of your sense of what a somatic yoga is? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, that, that's, the en es sorry, that's the essence of, of the tantric practices was to be aware of the experience while you're having it, whatever that experience was and whatever the sensation that was arising. And... Um, you know, in one realm, so many people have focused on let's, let's get really good at alignment or let's get really flexible, which takes you out of that realm. And, and I find it ironic because the Hatha yoga practice is a tantric based practice. It grew out of Tantra. Um, and, and then the flip side is you've got all these teacher trainings based in, in, in the asana practice that are using potentially sutras as their as their philosophy guideline which is not a hatha or a tantric text it's 
uh, Raja Yoga tech. So it's, it's teaching you how to meditate. Um, so I think that's why there's been so much uh, confusion and conflict. Mm. Um, confusion primarily. I think a lot of people are, are doing without questioning. Yeah. And this is, this is the time to question. So you said a lot of really good stuff there. So I want to underline some points here for listeners because of what you just said. We could just have, oh, we could take apart for a good hour. No, it's fantastic. It's rich. It's a feast you're serving up. So, um, so the idea here is that yoga, you know, can be disturbing and maybe um, surprising ideas that modern post yoga could be potentially dissociative if we're just following shapes rather than sensation. And I guess I'd add to that also it could be dissociative if it's too physically intense that we're actually not being aware of some of the more subtle sensations of self. Um, and certainly following a form is overriding, uh, overriding our actual felt sense rather than, rather than feeding into that, following that. And the second thing is that when you say tantra, just to define that, as, as, a, as listeners might associate that with sort of um, long-haired people eye-gazing and having sexy time, but you're using it, as I understand it, in a sort of Christopher Wallace sense of, um, an approach to spirituality very much uh, connected to life and the experiencing of life rather than some yoga and some yoga texts which are coming from this point of view of the body as disgusting and getting away from life and transcending these this sort of worldly desires um, and potentially being one of the sort of main kind of texts used in yoga not really about modern postural yoga in any way shape or form right like somehow it's become attached to it, but it's become popular somehow, but it's not really um, uh, in line with, with what most people doing modern post yoga would be remotely interested in. Absolutely. You said that all much more clear than I did. <laughs> I think we're, we're working well together today. It's a team <laughs> effort rather than interrupting each other today. Or so, um, okay. So, so what does that look like? Give us an idea. If someone's there and they're home and they're, you know, because I'm meeting a lot of yogis who are doing some posture <clears throat> yoga. They're getting into embodiment a little bit, somatics, and they're going, I, I want to enrich my practice. I've got, you know, I know the shapes. I've done some downwards dog. I've done a couple of years of uh, Ashtanga or something like that. And then they're wanting to make their yoga uh, practice more embodied, more somatic. How, how could they do that? Well, they have to, first of all, flip their perception on, on its head. And I always, uh, in all my workshops, the first thing I ask is, why do you show up to practice? Like, find yep. your why yep. first. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, and that, that will weed out some people. Some people are definitely, um, I... I love the way it makes me feel. Uh, it keeps me active. It gives me more energy. It's all just what I would consider, um, you know, an alternative to going to the gym, perhaps. A nice or, health you know. and exercise practice, yeah. right? Nothing and wrong that, with that and not with Absolutely. Doing, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people, when they're asked, why? Why do you practice? Mm. It automatically invites um, some self-discovery. Because you have yes. to peel, peel back the layers to figure out, well, why do I really show up? Because if I'm not here to just exercise, there's got to be more layers underneath that. And I always start with a somatic meditation. And for people that aren't familiar with somatic meditation, if you are familiar with Vipassana, which um, is pretty popular, at least a lot of people know about it worldwide, it's you're, you're, you're taking your awareness through the body in stillness to experience what, what sensations are there. Um, and that automatically takes our awareness away from the external and away from how am I sitting? Because yep. it's not about how I'm sitting, but it's what do I feel while I'm sitting here? And so we've automatically turned the radio station, so to speak, mm -hmm. to a sensory non-judgmental um, awareness. And then when we start moving, I've already, I've already invited that dialogue. In other words, the dialogue between you and what you're aware of into your movement. And when, um, I think the biggest to say it pretty concisely, but it's obviously not the whole picture. Instead of telling people what to do, I'm asking questions. Yes. Yeah, this is important. So first of all, like that, that why you hear question, that might sound obvious to people. But actually, yoga can be so many, the word yoga can be so many different things to so many different people. And I think it's a cop out to say, well, it's what you make of it or it's what you take away. Because actually, the method follows the aim. 
and different methods as better suited to different aims. You know, fit. I was in the gym the other day lifting weights and I, I wasn't particularly trying to be mindful with it. It didn't really matter because it was exercise, you know, uh, right. and that can be helpful, but it's not, was my aim at that moment. I was just exercising. And so I think that's not immediately obvious to many people that yoga may be, have different aims and that, that establishing like, okay, we're doing this. And there's, there's nothing wrong with this other thing, but this is the key thing here. And then establishing body awareness as a base, right? So beginning with that body scan, the body awareness, the basic mindfulness of the body. I, I'd argue at that point, it's not yet a fully somatic or embodied yoga in that you can still be aware of the body as an object, However, it's a sort of precursor, isn't it, to the stuff that you want to stuff that you're getting into after that. I, I am in EYP as well, that we have to start with that base of actual awareness before we can be like, well, how am I as this? Right. Absolutely. When I'm running my teacher trainings, I talk about the three layers of teaching or rather the three layers of learning how people will turn their practice towards an embodied, an embodied practice. And mm. the first uh, the first layer is literally just getting you to understand how you feel in the physical movement. Um, because that's very different than telling you where your feet, you know, where your big toes should be, where your knee should be in line with this. <laughs> and that's not necessarily going to get you into a feeling. You might create a, 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 some kind of cognitive memory of making that shape that your body will go back into but if nobody's asked you how you mm. feel, you might not recognize, you know, perhaps discomfort or that you're clenching your jaw while you're doing it or things like that. So we have to start at that very basic level of, I just need to get you to understand how you feel in this body as it moves. Um, and then when we move on to the second layer, that's when people People realize, okay, there's something beyond just, oh, my wrist feels good if yes. I, you know, move it this way as opposed to the way I was told to move it or things like that. We move on to a layer that's more um, sensory that becomes like Donna Fari lays out all the different energetic bodies. We start to be able to tune into those subtleties and, and, the, and the movement of prana. So the movement of that energy, we can feel that in the body. And then I always say the final layer is that integration where it becomes um, a moving meditation that's not just about, oh, I'm focusing on my breath, therefore I'm aware and this is a moving meditation. A lot of people finish my classes and they almost don't know where they've been in a way. You know, they feel like they always say, I've been on this amazing journey, but I can't even remember what shapes we made. And, um, and to me, that's a really good result because they, they weren't, I was just the guide as opposed to the director. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and they're less focused on the shapes that they're in and more about their, their internal sensation, right? That's a, a kind of good definition of somatic yoga and as yeah. you say there's different ways to cut that there's the buddhist model of sensation and then feeling tone for example uh and then the kind of coach's model of kind of increasing subtlety of feeling from raw physical like you know listeners listening to this it's like okay my bum is on the chair but i can feel pressure on my feet on the ground and then there's the kind of uh, emotional quality of that like oh i feel sad that i'm so weighted down or i feel relaxed that i'm so weighted down i feel happy that i'm so grounded and then there's a sort of subtle kind of sensations that, that kind of come with that that might be kind of like that get hard to verbalize in terms of sort of aliveness or that tingling of the bliss body, the kind of tingling on one's body and the sort of subtleties within that where I, I think people make mistakes in describing these in terms of esoteric terms, but there's certainly a reality to the uh, subjective sense of those bodies, if you will. Absolutely. And you touched on something that's really important. They're hard to describe. When you get to that layer, it's very difficult to, to describe. And it's not something I yeah. feel that needs a description mm -hmm. because it's so individual. And, um, and that's, that is something that really the individual has to own themselves. And we have to give them permission to own that. And as teachers or as guides, we're not there to tell them, oh, it should feel like this, or you're headed towards a state of bliss. Well, what, what does that even mean? You know, I think bliss in almost yeah. all, you know, spiritual traditions, even, you know, the Buddhists will say, we can't really define what, what you'll experience at that moment. 
and it's it's when you're when you're in it it's so uh it's so it almost becomes tangible but i recognize definitely after shavasana it's not a time for me to ask anybody questions <laughs> yeah yeah it's like people are like deep in the sort of non-verbal yeah. animal body in it it's almost Absolutely. painful sometimes to pull people out of that. And I had experiences where I've been in a class and they'll start doing their advertising spiel after Shavasana for their, for their, you know, um, latest yoga holiday or whatever. And it will be like, give me a minute to be nonverbal and, and to enjoy that, right. Not to jump straight on my phone and start texting someone to actually enjoy that nonverbal kind of animal body. And I, I want to come back to something you said before that I think is really important that, I see your work and others who I see on the lead edge of the kind of yoga world. I do think this is a trend in yoga uh, leading towards this, I guess you'd call it a more humanistic way of teaching. If we take that term from therapy where it's, it's a lot like coaching, which I come from that background, which has a lot in common with humanistic psychotherapy where yeah. the idea is it's inquiry based and question based rather than mm-hmm. command based. And I, I think that's not just a different method. That's a, a primarily, more empowering and it points to a uh, different authority doesn't it so it's quite a profound shift that it's not just oh yeah i'm using a different method to teach oh absolutely 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 i 100 percent agree um i think all of the the spiritual practices um or layer a person is in their meditation or just in their understanding of of how they are in in the world as part of a community or as, as a teacher or a leader or as a student or wherever that is, I think um, the principles behind so much of what we're offered across the board are, can we question ourselves as opposed to um, this, this, you know, what we've, what we've cultivated over the, certainly the last 2000 years with a, you know, the more Christian Judeo, um, let me give you a list of rules. Oh, I'm going to interrupt and, you there. That's, it's not yeah. just Christian Judeo, it's as Hindu as it gets as well, right? I mean, yeah, mainstream no, was... Hinduism is also, like, just in case we're a bit harsh on Western culture here, I mean, these traditions are firmly rooted in Buddhism, Hinduism, and definitely Confucianism. Right. And that's what, I mean, that was, that's what I was going to follow up with. Um, not that you were interrupting me, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one, that's one, three strikes, I'm out. That was a conscious interruption. That's a little different. No, that, that was different. Because, yeah. And so what I was going to say is that because we're so used to those rules, um, I, that, that's an assumption, but because many people are used to those rules and we've, we've, we've kind of guided our modern society around these rules. This is what it means to be a good person. This is what it means to be a bad person. And then, and then these modern Western people get really interested in into the yoga practices and into the, um, the Buddhists or, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, Confucianism, Taoism, and they're given a different set of rules, but what they don't realize is that it is still this set of rules by which I can gauge myself within the progress. Like, you know, being in school, if I study really hard, I'll get an A on my exams. And, and that permeates the yoga world in terms of, not allowing people to question themselves. Mm. But I think the underlying of all of those philosophies, when you take away the rules, the underlying is like, you know, the ultimate question, you know, who am I? And the, I think the somatic practices are that, that doorway into it. We have the tantrics talk about the fact we have a body in order to explore these questions. Mm. Yeah. And there's, I think in this, there's a values clash that's coming in it. On the one hand, we bring our implicit philosophies of how to learn and, you know, enjoyment and all these kind of implicit philosophies, whatever cultural background we're from, we bring to our yoga without whether we want to or not. That's the first thing I'd say. And uh, secondly, I really see a profound values clash. And there hasn't really yet been a Western but deep approach to yoga. So there's been a sort of Western kind of mechanization of postural practices coming out of yoga but there's it's only now that i think we're bringing the depth practices of the west so things like humanistic traditions so body psychotherapy traditions theater is another tradition that has a great body kind of um, knowledge to it from the west uh, psychotherapy i mentioned so like i feel like only now are we starting to develop a, a depth approach to yoga which is is 
is Western, like explicitly, as opposed to simply being a kind of abomination impersonation of Eastern practices, stripped of all their kind of d- depth. Um, so, oh, right. so I sort of see yeah. your, your, your practices as one of those attempts at a sincere Western approach to a depth of yoga. And that's, that's so important that, um, and I love that, that, that sort of title, that Western approach to yoga is so important right now um, because as we're evolving in the yoga world, and it is evolving and it's evolving so fast. It's, it's insane. And anytime something grows so quickly, of course you get a lot of confusion and you've got a lot of different branches going off. And this is something I'll be talking about in the, in the workshop in at yoga campus in London is, um, is this is an evolving practice and we are primarily Westerners doing this practice. And we're now coming to that, that important point where we realize we have to make this right for us. Mm -hmm. We haven't grown up in an Eastern culture, which is rife with chaos and, and life. You know, I've spent, I spent 10 years living in India. Um, I I still go back to India every winter and uh, it is an environment. It is a culture of chaos. So within that, it makes sense to focus on some rigid discipline. But it was never meant for the masses, right? This, these rigid disciplines were, were designed to focus, you know, mostly the Brahmins, mostly men, mm. mostly when it comes to the, the later asana practices, um, certainly young men. I think most people in the yoga world are familiar with that. Yes. But we, we grow up in, in a society that has very clear uh, safety regulations, very clear um, rules and you behave, what you can't, what is politically correct, correct as well as what is culturally correct, yes. and what are our safety rules. We, and, we drive on one side of the road. <laughs> you know, that's, right? Oh, like, yeah. Going to India, you know, because it's, it's way, way more chaos, even today. Let alone like 2,000 Absolutely. years ago, people were dying of the black death outside your door. It's, it's, it's right. a totally different environment. <laughs> I always say to people, you know, if you're going to drive in India, that you drive on the left side of the road is merely a suggestion. <laughs> 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 you know, believe me, not, there's, there are no rules there. So, so some of those, you know, some of those rules and regulations in those, in those practices were designed for the culture of the time. And, and even continuing, although they are getting a little bit more organized with certain things. But, but we were the antithesis of that. So we need to embrace that um, exploratory uh, practice. We need to be curious instead of predictive. And we love prediction. We love to be able to go in and work on something, analyze results so that we can create more progress. Mm-hmm. And that's probably going to feed our fear, going to feed our judgment-based culture. And I don't think if you ask people why you show up to practice, that would be what they were looking for. I'm looking for progress in my yoga practice so that I can get to the end of my life and say, well done, I'm a good person. I now can get both feet behind my head and chant all of the Sanskrit sutras. I mean, that really isn't, I think, why most people practice. Yeah, I mean, that key question of like, why are you practicing? And I think, that, you know, the question there really is, what do you need? Yeah, and I, I think this is partly time dependent. As you say, it's partly place dependent. Like I, like you, I teach in different cultures and, you know, the Russians and the Swedes, you know, I'm in Sweden today and in Russia not long ago, they have t- entirely different cultures in regards to their, say, how they value openness or their ability to, um, uh, you know, what is very politically correct and what isn't. Uh, one has very right. rigid gender roles and one has almost no sense of gender. Like it's, it's, it's quite different. And then there's the individual differences. So I see a lot of people going to sort of free movement yoga practices who should probably actually do a bit more discipline practice. Like for me, as someone who's quite chaotic and addictive and kind of wants to do what I want all the time, it's actually quite good for me to go to my anger yoga class and follow a structure. Whereas Absolutely, yeah. for some people, it's the opposite. They need to actually reconnect with themselves and feel themselves and find their own authority again. Well, you know, I'm in no danger of losing my sense of my own authority. Whereas there are, there are some people who ha- have to really find that. And um, yeah, so there's those individual choices as well, right? Absolutely. And I think we, we just need to create a, a, a global dialogue that this is okay, that this is, we're allowed to define what modern Western yoga is 
based on our needs. And, and it might, like you said, it might look very different in Russia and it might look very different in the United States. And then again, very different in Spain, you know? Um, I think, I think it's time for us to be okay asking questions, exploring and being curious instead of worrying about, are we, are we going against tradition or legacy? Um, yes. Because that seems to be something that keeps a, a, a pretty strong stranglehold on some people from, from actually thinking outside the box. And I always think, well, what? It's not your tradition. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. It's, if it's something that you've adopted, you wouldn't... I'm trying to think of a good example. Maybe you, you've got one somewhere in your it's, head. But, oh, you know, I know. What Chinese other tra- food is different in every country, right? Like, right. Like you have Chinese food in the States. It's different from Britain. It's different palates. And that's, you know, it's different in different places, depending on the local vegetables, depending on the local, what people eat meat or not, you know, whether certain kinds of meat are not allowed in that country. So Chinese people go everywhere and they make Chinese food, but it's quite adapted to different places, right? Right, like, right. Like, I just, that's a fairly... There we go. A non-controversial example from me for a change. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. The other one that just came to my mind is tango. You know, if you, mm. if, you pra- if you go to a milonga or a tango school in Argentina, the, the actual dance, you know, most of the steps remain the same throughout the world. But then the, the whole approach to it is incredibly different if you're doing it in Zurich or if you're doing it in New York City. Um, yeah. We changed, yeah, it's a, we changed the, the code of conduct because the code of conduct in Argentina is very strict. But believe me, the Argentines don't care at all. If they show up in, in New York City, they don't mind that the codes have changed. The, the essence of the dance, again, the why. Why do you get on the dance floor to do the tango remains, you know, a very individual and personal motivator. Yeah, knowing knowing the historical roots is helpful, right? Like tango, you know, came from, as I understand it, uh, there was a time when there was a lot of immigrants working on the docks in Buenos Aires and there weren't really enough women. Um, and there, so there was a sort of strong gender ratio with way more men than women and that, that was why people kept changing partners and men used to dance with each other. So it has a certain kind of background in that. And it was meeting a certain need and a certain time. This longing that's in tango was coming from the longing all these immigrants that were working in the docks were having for home. So there's, right. like, there's an emotional quality that comes from somewhere. And, you know, do I need that emotional quality in my life? Is that going to be helpful for me? Is there, you know, I've been to gay tango where men dance with men and that's really interesting. And I, you know, I've been to milongas where women will ask men to dance, which, you know, the average sort of sexist Argentinian is going to find absolute anathema. But in Sweden, that's <laughs> probably going to go down quite well, you know. Right. So it's, right. it's different. Yeah. It's different. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So if we, yeah, if we look at the, at the yoga with that approach, like it's okay. I think, I think right now, hopefully in another five to 10 years, we won't, you know, it'll be, of course, that that'll be the, that'll be the comment. Of course. But right now we have to give ourselves permission. People have to give themselves permission and not worry about these legacies or these traditions. We have to keep asking, why do I practice? What's useful? What do I need? Um, and, and, and ha- what, what equates my own self-worth within this? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Like, where are you getting your self-worth from through a practice? Is it that you're this, you know, implicit Western achievement cultures infected it somehow? And you're getting, because your self-worth's coming from being better than yesterday, better usually being more physically flexible or stronger. Is it that you get uh, praise from the guru that's another way of getting self-worth mm-hmm. right it's through like being close to Iyengar and I still people see on their websites direct student of da, 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 you know or is it that you get the self-worth through the likes of Instagram the sort of pornographied kind of yoga that we, we see increasingly so it's like right. where where is your self-worth and validation coming from through a practice and I see a lot of dishonesty around this like 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 I just don't see, I'd say the majority of people involved in yoga being honest about this. Oh yeah, <laughs> completely. And that's, and that's, I think in uh, being in that uh, goal driven fear based society that the West um, is really, you know, it's just people don't even realize that's what they're, that's what's driving them. 
Yeah, right. It's just there. It's not people's fault in a way because they're just it's just the soup that they you know, cooked in. It's just the air they're right. breathing. It's, it's the norm. It's you know we are we've never had more people um, showing photographs of themselves doing absolutely nothing than ever in time. <laughs> you know, um, and obviously the better you look doing whatever you're doing, then that makes you a better person. And and it was really interesting. Um, I think it was just after we we had a um, our our last chat. I was in India. So it was last December. And then I went to teach in Dubai, which is a very young culture. It's very, mm. uh, let's just say, monetary-based primarily. So a lot of that feeds over into the yoga world. Mm -hmm. And I had a very amusing comment from somebody who towards the end, it was a week-long um, workshop with teachers and she said, oh my God, you're like such an amazing teacher and you've got so much information and knowledge and you know, you don't, you'd have hardly any Instagram followers. <laughs> and I just laughed and it kind of made me want to like just delete my Instagram uh, completely. And I just thought her, she was shocked. She expected, yeah, yeah. she expected that to be the draw, you know? Or an actual uh, measure of your skill, right? right? So that was a surprise because it was like, well, how could you be so skilled? And that's so few Instagram followers when, you know, it's it, in a, we live in a very visual world and increasingly visual and people have more, far more photography than even when I was a young person, let alone 50, 100 years ago. And um, it, it's, 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 it's just part of the scene we're in, isn't it? That it's, it's so visual. And, you know, while we do look like models, Julie, you and I, you know, we happen to be blessed <laughs> that way. It's, it's tough it. for people who, um, <laughs> someone said to me in Russia, they said, but you are too fat to do yoga. How can you be a yoga teacher? <laughs> and I, I'm not like massively fat. Oh. I'm, a bit, I'm a little bit hobbity. But, um, you know, it's, uh, they, were, they, were like, they were like genuinely asking me how I could possibly be a yoga teacher when I didn't have a six pack, you know, and, and I'm in great health as well. So I, I thought that was, was kind of funny. Yeah. It, it, the, the, it's, it's ironic. <clears throat> and I think it's, I think it's important, you know, people, people like you and I, and a lot of people that have been working on, you know, evolving and developing within our practices and investigating, we still have that confidence within ourselves. Mm. Like I don't, I don't, I don't judge myself by how many Instagram followers I have or what kind of photos I put up. I judge myself on, on content and I judge myself compassionately. I want, I want to strive to, to be even more useful for my students. So a judgment for me is, oh, I, I can create better content. I can make this clearer or I can take this further where I think uh, so many people out there, especially people that are under 35, they're wrestling with where, again, self-worth. Where is my self-worth as a yoga teacher in a world that is telling me if I don't look a certain way and if I don't have a certain amount of Instagram followers and if I don't have a lot of you know, interaction on my Facebook page or a lot of people clicking on my videos, then where do I fit in this world? And um, that's probably the, the, for me, it's the most heartbreaking thing I come across when I'm holding teacher trainings because I don't teach uh, entry level teacher trainings. I don't teach level ones. I only teach teachers. And, um, and so many of them are, are self-conflicted. And I, I get concerned because I think, don't let this get in the way of the content you want to share. Yeah. And I think the wonderful thing, though, is that the yoga market, the yoga world, called the market, is maturing. And people are coming to you and to EYP and to, you know, other, other people we know who are doing Gary Carter and Pete Blackaby mm -hmm. and, you know, Pete Blackaby sort of taking off as, a, as a sort of getting famous across the pond now. It's like... It's like, I barely, you know, I have to say to him, Pete, stop. I want you to stay in Brighton and teach me with five other <laughs> people, you know? It's like, it's, 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 uh, it's taking <laughs> off and people are understanding this approach. Um, by the way, uh, her name on Instagram is Brahmani Julie, and she has 1,970 followers compared to my 1,947. So you are 23 <laughs> people better at yoga than me, Julie. That's uh, we're neck and neck. First 1,000 wins. So uh, listeners, listeners, add us both. Hashtag 
hashtag, 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 uh, hashtags and nonsense. So, um, <laughs> what, how would you kind of sell like this approach to yoga? Like, because we're already in the market, it's all about sales. You have to admit there's a reality here. Like, if someone said, "Listen, you know, I do yoga and it's fit and it's great, but I'm kind of curious about what else is there." Like, why would I want to do a somatic approach to yoga? Like, what benefit would all this kind of um, closing my eyes and feeling and wriggling around do me? Um, personally, it's an antidote to the, the society that we've cultivated because I can find my self-worth from the inside. I can find that sense of calm and peace and connected, um, you know, my center. I don't like to use too many um, hippie words because I think it alienates some people. But I, I start to understand the only thing I have is me. That's it. I have me. I have my awareness. Um, everything else is transient. Um, nothing's permanent. Nothing is secure. And, when, and, and all of that, I think, creates that, that confusion and often the lack of self-confidence or the lack of self-worth because so many people are looking for grounding or centering in something else whether it's do this 30 day challenge or um, sign up for another online course, but it's nothing happens without going inside. Nothing changes. You can't repattern fascia. You can't work with the nervous system. You can't do anything until you look inside. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's so important right now. And, and I know you love to have this, this fantastic fiery dialogue with the liberal world. And, um, and I do too, because I think so much of the liberal world and, and especially the yoga environment, they're in this state of blame. Oh my God, look at us. We're in this, we're going into this conservative political um, dark ages or whatever it is. And look at the state of the world. And I think, but you know, we're, yoga practitioners, we're yoga teachers. What a better time to, to be, to have this as a skill and this as a knowledge base and this to share. We get to thrive right now because if everything in life was super hunky dory and everybody was happy and well balanced and nobody was on, you know, opioids or any other chemicals, we would, uh, we would be obsolete. Mark, you and I would be out of business. <laughs> be out of a job if people were actually happy and we weren't in this you know, largest crisis of sort of mental illness and suicide and depression, and anxiety that ever existed. But uh, so, so there is definitely an opportunity for us here, but it's also fantastic times to be a yogi, right? I mean, right. You know, I went to this yoga festival this weekend in Sweden and I was teaching, but there was five rhythms there and there was, there was 10 kinds of yoga and there's yoga teachers from 10 different countries and it was brilliant and nice people and, you know, conscious dialogue and great food. And I just thought, you know what, this is amazing. And the, the internet, the stuff like, you know, we're putting out there online, which makes the stuff accessible very cheaply for the first time in human history. Like, like I feel like a little bit of uh, gratitude often missing from the far left a little bit of gratitude and, um, you know, is very, goes a long way in, in the modern world too. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. I think we need to, yeah, we need to, um, we, we need to let go of that fear-based mentality in the yoga world because it, it's, it's crept in as well. We need to say, yeah, we're here to serve people. We're here to be the antidote to what you see on your computer screen or on your phone. This, we've got the skills, we've got the tools, and we can cultivate community very easily. Like you said, you know, yoga festivals popping up everywhere. Wanderlust seems to be in a different city every weekend somewhere in the United States. You know, there's, we've, got, we've got access. People have access now more than ever to find, um, you know, methodologies, tools, co human connection. The yoga world is so, um, you know, we like the human connection. We don't really want to be on the internet. That's the, that's the irony. We don't yeah. want to be on the internet, but we have to in order to run our businesses <laughs> these days. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there in Stockholm or Sweden, and I wouldn't be here in Hawaii, and that's yeah. having a connection without the internet. So it's, you know, but um, ultimately our practices is, are about, you know, switching off all of that stuff and, and tuning inwards. Wow. Um, 
yoga is becoming almost a necessity, isn't it? To have a mindfulness practice, to have an embodied practice, or be yoga or dance or something else. I, I, you know, I'm at a narrative now. This stuff is getting big because it bloody has to, because because we are really hitting a wall in terms of mental health, in terms of physical health, in terms of spiritual health, individually, societally, and as a planet, we're really hitting a wall, and. It's not anymore like, okay, well, yoga is something nice you can do if you're in a spiritual elite. It's becoming like, I, I, I sort of, my pace, you know, running a business, my life is pretty much like most normal office workers, two or three days a week at least, you know? Mm-hmm. And, I, and just doing it two or three days a week, that sort of fast paced, 10 hours, you know, lots of emails, international working. I go, wow, I just about feel okay with mm-hmm. my 30 minutes of meditation in the morning, an hour of yoga at night. And I mm-hmm. feel like, wow, and I've been doing this a long time. So I've got resources, I've got skills, I can practice centering and all the things I practice. And it's, um, I, I think, well, if I'm just about coping with this lifestyle three days a week, the average guy who works in an office doing this five or six days a week without those skills, he is fucked. And I, <laughs> right. I, 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 just, I just think, shit, how are they even surviving? And I, I think I'm a professional, I can barely manage this three days a week now the two days i'm teaching it's an entirely different reality but it's 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 like wow we're we're not i don't think we're doing something special anymore i think we're doing something the equivalent of um knowing how to drive a car or knowing how to use a dishwasher or not even that knowing how to what's a basic life skill knowing how to brush your own teeth All right you know, it's, it's, it's that <laughs> basic yeah absolutely absolutely I say absolutely a lot. <laughs> <laughs> totally, Julie. Like, oh my God. Like, I'm like, you lived in England for years and we didn't get that out of you. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why I, you know, I get, I get a little bit, um, uh, I get a little bit of that mothering hmm. sort of irritation when I come across <laughs> yoga teachers that, um, that say, Oh, but it's so depressing to be in the world, and there's there's so much you know conflict, and I'm so sensitive, and I'm like, snap out of it, bitch! Come <laughs> on, <laughs> you well, have. Well, well first of all, there's, there's this, that's the escape <laughs> side of yoga, isn't it? The god realm right. escapism of going to Bali and you know going to the beautiful yoga studio where the poor people are outside and you're inside, and there's an escape quality which is not a tantric approach, right? Of being no. in life and being yeah. feeling in life and being present to life and turning up and fucking voting and doing normal things and, you know, parenting or whatever, running a business, whatever your thing is. And um, it strikes me that that's what's really needed here. And I'm also aware, you know, my tone can be cantankerous about this. I'm kind of going, how do I best want to approach it? Because I want to be challenging, but I also don't just want to be an asshole looking for a fight the whole time. And you can get kind of like mothering and a little bit, you know, naggy maybe, you know what I yeah. mean? It's like, <laughs> And it's like, on the one hand, I really want to acknowledge all the beautiful stuff that's there and the fact that people are doing their best. And, you know, the fact that sometimes it's, there's a sort of gateway drug thing going on with postural yoga that le- leads into deeper things like the somatic yoga and the body therapy and the other things. And it's something about finding the tone here, like finding the, the note which speaks the truth without backing down. But, and it's challenging, but simultaneously can be listened to. Yeah, that's that's really important because I think that comes back to uh, some accountability and 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 accountability in the yoga world. I think needs to be upheld by the seniors in the yoga world. Um, and and just as a, I think there's a way to do it. Just keep the guidance needs to be in in that direction. The guidance needs to be. Yes, we're cu- we're cultivating practices that might make us more sensitive or more, um, you know, looking at oh, I've got such all these wonderful, you know, tools for myself. But then I open up the door and I just want to shut it again. And that's not again. That's that shouldn't be anybody's why. It should be how can I use these tools? As you said, like the tantric practices, you know, get out there and be in life and. And let that be your experience. Sometimes we don't even need to get on the mat or sit on the meditation cushion to have a very powerful experience of being a, a spiritual human, just being out there. And I think um, more teachers need to, um, to reiterate that instead of, you know, I'd love for a lot of the senior teachers to just like let go of some of the more physicality. And I don't mean stop teaching 
um, movement and asana, we're a sedentary society. We know very sure. well, we to need move. to keep moving. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There's it's, it's an absolute must. Mm-hmm. And like you said, some, some days, some weeks, some years, people will need something that's very rigid. You know, I know people that their minds are so chaos, you know, so chaotic and, um, and the, yeah, an Iyengar practice suits them and stick with it. But, um, but the overall picture is, you know, how, how do I use these tools to interact in society, in society, to be part of that, to be part of a community, to be part of a culture yes. that is, is um, by example, helping us move forward to something more balanced because we can't go either or we're looking for balance, right? Within yep. the bigger picture. And can I use those yoga skills to help people around me as well as myself find that balance? Yeah, this is Chris Gladwell talks about engaged yoga, which I really like as a term, mm. you know, like engaged Buddhism. So it's in the world and of it rather than abstract from it. And then, you know, doing our self-care practices, doing the physical practices that we need and bring that. And I, I think this is, uh, you know, I really ask listeners to be like, okay, ways in which to look at ways in which you're othering yourself deliberately as a way to be special. So that might be dressing differently differently. You mentioned like not being too hippie in your language. So like, you know, me and you, I think we speak relatively plainly. Like Mm. you could be in an average American household talking about this stuff and people would get it. You know, it's like, okay, okay, we, yes, we use some specialist technical terms like somatic and embodied, but there's not a way we're like changing our voice to do the yoga voice, for example. (laughs) Um, And we can get rid of that jargon if need be, you know, like someone told me to define embodiment the other day. So it's how we are. You know, and simple words, simple definitions. People do it with clothes. They do it with words. They do it with lifestyles. They do it with living in special places. And it's it's uh, I don't know. It's a cop out, really. This this engaged approach seems to be the um, what I'm interested in anyway. Yeah, yeah, me too. I think yeah, it's so uh, relevant right now. So Julie, we do need to wrap this up. Um, okay. where, where can people, I talked to you all day about this stuff. I'm very much, I've got the dates in a diary. I don't think I paid for you. I've got the dates in a diary for your trip to London. So I'll be, uh, I'll be there as a learner for a four, I think it's five or six days, isn't it? So I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, fantastic. W- w- what else have you got out there? People can see where can people find out more about you? You can find out where I am uh, traveling throughout the world, teaching on brahmaniyoga.com. And that has an H in it, B-R-A-H-M-A-N-I, yoga. And I will be launching an online school for teachers and practitioners sometime in the new year, for those of you that can't travel. I'm also a featured teacher on Eckhart Yoga, which is an online um, yoga classroom. So that's a lot of my classes are up there. They think they release a new class with me every three weeks. So um, right. yeah, because I know most of you would love to come to Hawaii and study with me. But... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Tough, tough someday, game. tough game, maybe one day. It's a way away. <laughs> Listen, Julie, thank you so much for rejoining the show, being our first guest to come on twice. And uh, you know, I really, I really value what you're doing. You know, for me, it's pretty rare to go spend five or six days with a, uh, a yoga teacher these days, but uh, you're one of the few in the world that I really want to do that with. So, uh, you know, for me, that, that says a lot. And I um, really appreciate you coming back on the show today. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. And I'm honored that you're coming to spend five or six days with me. Um, I feel like I really need to deliver. <laughs> You'll be great. Subscribe to get more. And you can also leave us a review on iTunes, which helps with our rankings. So really appreciate that. Um, equally, if you want to support the podcast even more, then fund us. Um, go to Patreon. Give us a dollar per episode. Um, those who don't know, Patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world. I know like so much is available for free now. And, you know, what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it. You know, more than I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free. Uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. And of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.